George Pine is a 40 under 40 Hall of Famer. He first made our list in the program's first year, 1999. You were a 35 year old vice president of NASCAR. You made the list in 2001 as senior vice president of NASCAR and made our Hall of Fame in 2003 as COO of NASCAR. Uh, each position was a stepping stone to a very successful career that we'll discuss today. George, thanks for joining us on the SBJ iFactor. Great to be here, Abe. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great seeing you. And let's start like, like we do with the iFactor about your youth and how that influenced your path. Yeah, no, I guess, you know, two people that had a big influence, of course, both my parents, but my dad and my grandma, grandmother, my grandmother had a flower shop. And she ran her own small business and I worked in her flower shop as a kid. And I, I, I admired my grandmother and my father also was an entrepreneur as well. So I think both of them gave me a drive to want to aspire to be successful in business. And so those, uh, obviously you looked at work ethic and you looked at just the value of, uh, of daily, just hard work, right? Uh, and kind of the perseverance and moving forward. And, you know, I always had a job, you know, I was a, I was a paper boy. I, I scored games in baseball. I was a baseball umpire, Babe Ruth umpire. I washed dishes. I dug ditches. I was a laborer. Uh, I put in installed sewer and water pipes. So I was always working. Um, and I guess that had a little bit of influence. So I think working, having some tough jobs, you know, I was in a pot room and the pots came all day long and uh, digging ditches. I figured, you know, hey, I better work hard to get ahead. So those are good lessons, too. And we're talking about growing up, you were in Massachusetts. Sports was a big part of your life. Talk about the role that sports played in your journey. Yeah, you know, my dad was really good about it. My dad played for the Patriots. My grandfather played in the NFL as well. Um, but they never really put it in my face, but I was always around sports. And, you know, my dad was a ref and a football ref. So I'd go to a freshman game on Friday, varsity game on Saturday, JV game on Monday. But the was a basketball ref. So I was always around sports and like anybody else, I had the same name as my dad and granddad in a small town. So, of course, I wanted to be like them. And then you uh, obviously were a good student because you go to Brown, you play football at Brown. But what were your early education interests? What, what, what courses did you like? What subjects? No, I'm, I'm kind of different. I was, a, as you know, Abe, but I love politics. So I was a fan of the political science major. I remember telling my kids, they're like, Dad, what did you study in school? The guy said politics. Like, oh, my gosh, Dad, that's not even study. So that was kind of my passion. I kind of always thought I'd maybe I'd go to law school. But I, I was really interested in, in current events. And then decision making after Brown. I mean, was there a thought that you would try to play football as a career? Did you want to be an entrepreneur? What were you thinking? Of course, I wanted to play football, but I, but I wasn't good enough. And, I, you know, I, I went to work. Uh, for my dad's family business after after college and then uh, did that helped him we had some problems it was a, a tough time economically in New England my dad was a home builder helped him out for two or three years then decided to uh, take a job in Atlanta studying the public schools uh, in Atlanta in the early 1990s and that was so different because I remember you told me that was like analyzing um, school budgets and analyzing school operations. That was a pretty drastic change from what you were, you know, what you're doing now, but probably what you thought you'd want to do after college. Yeah, no, I think it's a good lesson for, for, for young people if you think about it. So why did I take that job? I, I networked the Brown alumni. I went to the alumni office. I was pretty full of myself. I said, here's my resume. And the lady said, get over yourself, rip up your resume. Here's the alumni book. Start calling people. And I called a guy that was a quarterback at Brown in the 1960s who was president of the Bar Association, referred me to some other people. And the reason I took that job was that all the presidents and CEOs of the local business community were on my committee. And they told me if I did a good job, one of those guys would hire me. And so there's a fellow named Sam Williams, who's a president of the Portman Company, which is a huge company downtown. I did a good job. We, we wrote a report on public education. It got promoted. I mean, it got a... I get sold and distributed, published, I'm sorry. And then uh, Sam hired me at Portman and I did strategic planning for Sam and represented the company in downtown Atlanta on the political front. And so that was really the one, I look back on my life, how did I get ahead at a young age was taking that job, being in front of presidents and CEOs and having one of those guys hire me almost as a chief of staff. And that just put me ahead at a young age. So there's a lot there in terms of getting some exposure to some important people, doing a good job, 
building the relationships that lead to your next job. And you, you mentioned, I, I believe John Portman, uh, he was a commercial architect and had a big, big business. And that job though, did have an influence on your later career at NASCAR, right? Because I think you were working about the licensing business a little bit or in trade shows, correct? Yeah, well, so what we did, I wanted to start a sports business for Portman. Portman had 27 buildings in downtown Atlanta. We had, um, we had 25 million square feet of real estate. And we had one of the largest trade show companies in the US. And the real estate market was contracting. We had a lot of empty space. So I was like, hey, we have the Super Bowl coming, the Olympics coming. Let's do sports events with our trade show company in the building. My boss was like, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. But finally, one day on the side, he said, you could do it. And I went out and got a license from Gene Upshaw. And my partners were Ronnie Lott and Marcus Allen. And we threw a thing started a thing called the world's largest Super Bowl party, which by the way, was very much like on location 25 or 30 years later. And we ran a four day event at the Super Bowl. We sold Super Bowl packages and we had 30,000 people come, 300 NFL players, it was a huge success. So that started a thing called AMC events. And then I had a buddy of mine whose wife was taking classes at Georgia State. She said, NASCAR is growing this way. NASCAR is growing that way. So I was like, all right, let's go down there. And signed those guys up as a client, and we did. And then a year and a half later, NASCAR hired me. That's a great story in terms of coming full circle. Because so, who was your interview with at NASCAR? The relationship you developed that hired you? Well, I'll tell you. I, back in those days, I wasn't making lots of money, but I'll tell you a true story. Again, it's interesting for young people going on. So, I'm starting this division at uh, at Portman, and somebody said you can go down and meet with uh, the owner's son but you have to show up in 48 hours. And I had was taking my first week off in like a year with my wife coming home to Massachusetts. So I went home with my wife, left her at my house with my parents and hopped on a plane uh, through a few connections down to Daytona Beach and made a presentation of Brian in France. And I know that because I showed up within 48 hours, it made a real impression on them. And that's probably one of the better decisions I ever made in my life because that led to signing up NASCAR as a client. And eventually I went on to work at NASCAR. So a lesson there for young people, like when you're asked to do something and it's an opportunity, you try to really make it work and do it, correct? Honest to God, it was my first vacation in a year and I didn't say, oh, I'm on vacation, I can't be there. I said, hey, I can meet the owner's son. Where do I need to be? I'll, I'll be there. And that, that was a big opportunity that worked out for me. We don't have nearly enough time to talk about all your, I would say, accomplishments at NASCAR. But George, give a little sense of kind of the things you learned because you were there at such a, an important part in NASCAR's history and working for Bill France, which must have been a, a, a lesson or experience in its own right. Yeah, working for Bill and Brian was fantastic. And Jim and Lisa as well. I mean, I always remember the first time I really spent some time with Mr. France. He said, work hard, tell the truth, and don't embarrass the, the company and you'll have a good future here. And I always get the sense working for Bill that if you gave your word, you honored it. And we were honor, honorable, not perfect, but honorable. And of course, I was there in 1995, opened up the first office outside of Daytona. It was called Winston Cup. You know, the 16 races were on the national network. And it was an incredible 10 year run there. I mean, I, I was just we just I hit it at the right time and we made the most of, of, of the opportunity. And so it was a lot of fun, I think. What did I learn from the, from uh, Bill France? He worked incredibly hard. Uh, he was a good guy. And, you know, I, you could go into him and say, hey, you know, we went in one time, said we want to do X, Y, Z. And he said, if you do that, I'm selling the company. And 30 days later, we were doing X, Y, or Z. So he would really be tough on you. But if you kept coming back and you believed in it, you could get things to uh, build through Congress. And so I really enjoyed working there. I, you know, I cried when I left. I loved the people, but I was there for 10 or 11 years and had a little itch at 40 years old. So you did see NASCAR through some really historic moments in terms of the growth of the sport, the expansion of the sport. You had the death of Dale Earnhardt, which was a huge, huge uh, moment in that sport's history. And like you said, learning from the right, uh, right hand of, of Bill France. But you said you had an itch. What kind of itch did you have? And did you know, wh wh where did you think it was going to lead? And then Teddy Forsman comes calling. Yeah, you know, I was 40 years old. We had just sold Nextel for $750 million which actually I always get mad was probably more because they had a 6% escalator. So it's really 950. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, we had done that. We sold the TV rights to Fox and NBC. As you said, we navigated the Earnhardt investigation. There was a big lawsuit, the FERCLA lawsuit. We 
So I felt like we had done, I had done all I could do at NASCAR and I was 40 years old and I was like, you know, I don't know if I see myself as a 20 year guy here. I, I, I need to do something else. And then I had a friend and one of the things I've done really well my whole life is, you know, I like to see people when I don't want anything. And you build relationships over time. And I had a friend of mine at Goldman Sachs who knew Ted and said, hey, you should go meet Ted Forsman. I didn't even know who Ted was. He had bought IMG like a year or so before. And uh, I went in to meet Ted. What also I didn't know at the time that one of Ted's uh, first nine investors was Roger Penske, who obviously had a big position in NASCAR and who I knew really well. So before I walked in to meet Ted, Ted had already debriefed extensively on me with Roger. And of course I met Ted and I thought it was a half hour meeting. I didn't really know too much about him. It was two hours and, and, and you know, two months later I was uh, president of I IMG. At the age of 40? At the age of 40. I think it's fair to say, and you, you could agree, you might disagree, but you, you joined IMG and then you went through a period of IMG of, again, pretty massive change because you were leaving the, it was the end of the McCormick era into the Teddy Forsman era, and there was just dramatic uh, a changing of the guard. There was a new approach. It was very, you know, that was a generous application. It was very, very difficult. One, being 40 years old, my peers were probably 55 to 65 years old at the senior levels of IMG, so my age was always an issue, so I'm always for young people. Ted was pretty good. He said, if you're young, just because it took you less time than everybody else to get to a destination, you shouldn't hold that against somebody. But but it was tough, and you know, really, Ted really replaced three people w w with me, and I kept my word at NASCAR not to hire any of the people that were with me, which I would never do again. It's like being a head coach of a football team with no assistance, right? I would just, you just wouldn't do that. But I kept my word and I had to start all over in a much bigger company working for a private equity guy, really restructuring businesses because initially what we did was a lot of restructuring. So that was really tough. Um, I can't say it was a lot of fun, but boy, I will tell you, I learned an awful lot. And I think I, the lessons I learned doing that and working in the, for a private equity guy really served me well today. The other thing too, I ended up going on the board of 24 Hour Fitness. Again, a company owned by Force and Little that was private equity owned. And so the learning there was really good. And why did I take IMG, one global, 30 countries, and two, Ted Forsman. I thought I could learn a lot uh, from Ted. And Ted was a tough guy, very successful, but you know, I was young, so nothing really bothered me. You know, I think uh, if I was older, I think Ted might've bothered me more, but I think at my young age, I kind of let it run, run down my shoulders. And it was really kind of thirsty to learn and get better. So a lot to unpack there. Let me start with, you said you learned a lot by working in private equity. What, what did you learn? Because right now, as we talk in 2021, George, so many young people come to me about that opportunity, about working in private equity. What did you learn? Well, the whole thing in private equity is about growing earnings, right? So if you can't grow earnings, uh, you're not going to be successful at, at private equity. And a little bit of sports is more about selling rights and maximizing rights. And that's very different than growing EBITDA. And so the whole way of looking at businesses and learning how to grow EBITDA or grow earnings uh, is very different than selling rights. And so working for Ted for those seven or eight years really taught me a lot of how to look at business, how to analyze business, what to look for, what the important things were. And one of the things I always felt like at the school study and at Portman and even IMG, I tell my kids this, like in a way, you know, I would have said at the time, I almost should have paid for the learning. Because I learned a lot. I learned credit, how, to, how, to, uh, how to look at credit, how to look at risk reward ratio, how to manage people, uh, how to analyze things were all things that I learned at, at, at working at IMG and with Ted Forsman. The only other thing about IMG was, which helps today at Bruin, is it's global. So how you know, global sports is better, uh, is broader than just the, the, the US. And so the combination of understanding global sports and looking at it through the lens of private equity, for me, was a great learning experience. Another thing you said there I want to just uh, uh, press on is, you said you learned a lot from Ted, difficult boss. What did you learn that you keep with you to this day, George, in terms of your leadership style? And as a sidelight, how is he different than, say, Bill France? Yeah, so, so with Ted, I think I really learned the risk-reward ratio. What's the upside? What's the downside? Is, is it worth it? And really how to analyze 
businesses, like any business that we invest in, I have to believe has to be able to get to a 20% EBITDA margin. Ted told me that what he learned is any business below a 20% margin is not really a business you should invest in as a private equity guy. So just there are different things about the fundamentals of businesses that I learned from him, but really the risk reward was the risk worth the reward. How are Bill and, and Ted different in, in, in Bill France and even John Portman? John Portman as a real estate guy, uh, self-made was really, you know, real estate guys got to plunk down a bunch of debt and take a bunch of risk. And so I'd say that, that Portman was more on the, was more risky, um, had a lot of guts, was an entrepreneur and took big chances and made big bets and he won more bets than he lost. Bill France is a second generation guy was uh, a little more reserved, I think, a little less risky. Still, like I said, a strength of his was he, he would change his mind. Even at 65 or 70 years old, you could get him to change, which I think was a real strength. But he was a little more cautious and more relationship you know, oriented. Ted was probably less risky than Portman, more risky than France, um, and just really smart. I mean, Ted was just really, really smart. They all were smart. I mean, for people to think about, so I worked for three guys, two were billionaires and Portman was probably close. They were all smart and they all worked hard. They did have very different personalities. I think Portman was more architectural, and more of an architectural genius. Bill France was more of an operator and somebody you trusted. And Ted was just a really smart guy who could be charming when he wanted when Ted wanted something, he was extremely charming. Yeah, I still remember sitting at a luncheon, uh, as a group luncheon, and boy, all eyes were on Ted Forsman as he had a table around him of about eight to 10 people, but he commanded that table and he just had everybody kind of on the palm of his hands with his charm. You know, I do want to move on because you then got your own entrepreneurial spirit that, you know, led you to start at that time. It was called Bruin Sports Capital. What led to that? Was that always in the back of George Pine's mind? Yeah, kind of, you know, working for those three guys, even my grandmother and my dad, there's a little bit of something about me that wanted to be kind of against the grain and had a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit. Unfortunately, my biological clock was ticking. You know, I was 48 years old and I knew IMG was going to sell. So about two years out, I started thinking about, well, if I don't say at IMG, what am I going to do? And I had a friend of mine who said, why don't you raise your own uh, capital vehicle and, and do what you do at IMG? And so as I thought about it, I was like, okay, I'm 48 years old. If this does, if I don't take this shot now, I can't take the shot when I'm 60. So let's take the shot now. If it doesn't work, I'll go in for four or five years and then I'll go get a job. And for everybody, for the young people, I mean, age always impacted me. You know, 25 years old, I had no money, moved to Atlanta. I was like, so what, I'll bill, I'll go home. NASCAR, I was 40 years old, I was itchy. I didn't want to be a 20 year guy. I wanted, to do, I wanted more. And then at 48, I was like, you know what? I want to take a shot, build something and build something that has my values, but also that I'm accountable for. And, and so here we are at Bruin Capital. Now, a few years in, I've talked to people who have done similar, not as ambitious as you've done it, but they say they would never go back and work in, say, corporate America or in the organized sports environment. Are you feeling the same way? They just love working on the, for themselves. Yeah, no, I, no, I liked everything I did, and, and, but I really liked with Bruin because at the end of the day, you have nobody that, to blame but yourself. And the one thing when you're working in a big organization, there's always politics. And with this, there's no politics. And so I, I love what I'm doing. I love being accountable. And I love the one of the things I love about my job is I get to meet so many interesting people that are building businesses around the world. Even if we don't acquire their company, it's also very interesting. And then the guys that we work with here at Bruin, I mean, they're fascinating people. So I love what I do. I appreciate my investors and you know, I'm excited about the future. When you built your team, George, talk a little bit about the attributes you were looking for in the personnel and the people you hired. What were must-haves and what were turnoffs? Yeah, so I really admired Roger Penske. So that's somebody that I look up to, the Penske organization. And what I like about the Penske's are they're straightforward, they're, they're clean cut, they're honest, and they work hard and they're very competitive. And so those were kind of the attributes that I wanted to have here at Bruin. So the first thing, I, I, I have all people that I like for the most part, hopefully they like me, but I like nice people who work hard, that are competitive, and that are intellectually curious, and that are honest. And I think those are the the things that I find attractive. You have to 
have smart people, but but you really want to have good people that represent you well. And, you know, that's what I've tried to shoot for. And when you're in an interview or I know when a candidate gets to you, they've been well vetted, but is there anything that incredibly turns you off or it's almost a deal breaker during the interview process of a candidate? And, you know, when I, when I interview someone, I always like to understand their background and where they're from and what they're about. Probably arrogance turns me off. Uh, it's not, I don't think being arrogant in sports is really going to be effective in the, in, and in life. Things that I like to see are just intellectual curiosity, um, people that have passion, people who want to work hard. Look, you know, smarts are important for what we're doing because it's very analytical, but you want smart people that can work hard and then that are good people. That, that, that's what I look for, really. Flip it back to you, the people I speak to who have worked with you in the past, familiar themes, George, you know, incredible hard worker, but incredibly devoted to family, demanding incredible t attention to detail. How would you call or characterize your management style? I think that's pretty fair. I, I think the, uh, I think all of those you know, details are important. So I have, a, I have a list of things I want to accomplish every single day and every single week and over a period of time. We run every business uh, with a really thought out business plan. Um, so we're pretty thoughtful and pretty detail oriented. I think that's really what gets you ahead. I mean, you have to have good ideas, but you have to be detail oriented. Um, you know, on the fam on the management side, you know, it's funny. When I was pretty tough at NASCAR. And then, you know, Ted used to say I was too nice. And if you told somebody at NASCAR that Ted Forsman thought I was too nice, they would have thought you were crazy. So as, at Bruin, I tried to kind of come to a middle ground and just kind of be a little bit more like I was at NASCAR, but still nice at the same time. And, it, you know, and lastly, I think having kids for me was a, a blessing in so many different ways, but as it relates to work, it made me not think about work. Mm. You know, I was a pretty driven guy. And, and so not thinking about work for me and focusing on my wife and my kids was, was a blessing that way. And I think everybody needs a balance in life. It may not be kids. It may be another interest or whatever, but you really need to have a balance in your life. Or I think you, 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 you get out of kilter on, on the work side. Yeah, no, I, I like that in terms of that approach. And, to, and when you talk about, you know, the ethos for Bruin, George, you know, I would see it, it's global because you invest in global companies. It's certainly technology focused. What else are some of the attributes you look for as your investments as you build Bruin Capital? Well, they got to be, so we, we're shooting for 25 or 20% IRR. So they have to be able to grow. And then we have to believe in our end that we can influence the outcome through whatever our, we think our expertise are. If we can't influence the outcome, we probably aren't going to invest. And what we've fallen into is a bit of an importer of technology to the U.S. and also now becoming an exporter because we've got a global, a global network. You know, we're in five continents and, and operate in 20 countries. And so that network now, we can put things in the network and, and put them in and outside the United States. And it's something that we continue to see grow. As we finish up here, George, a couple of more quick hitters. Uh, if you knew then what you know now, would you do anything differently? Yeah, I'd, I'd let things bother me a little bit less. You know, just take a long view. Don't let, let, it, let it roll down your shoulders. Um, don't let things bother you. And what would bother you? Pressures of work or uh, things you read or criticisms of you, all, all of the above? Not so much the criticisms of me, more success or failures at work. You know, I, I, taking work too serious, trying really hard. That's what I try to tell my kids, like, give a great effort and then don't let it bother you. Easy to say, hard to do. But if I was counseling myself 25 years ago, that'd be the advice. Any uh, failures that you would consider a good failure that you learned the most from? I would say all failures are good failures. And I think anyone that's taken chances in their life uh, have the failures. So the key, you probably learn more when you fail. So I think all failures are, are good failures. And I think when you're competitive, you want to get better. So I think taking a critical look at yourself is really important. Someone else I talked to called you the ultimate, like not networker, but connector with your relationships. You talked a little bit about your relationships are important when reaching out to people when you don't need anything. Give your thoughts and advice, particularly to young people about growing their personal relationship network in the sports industry. And so when I, when I was working for my dad and didn't want to stay home and, and, and work in the family business, I went back to Brown and, and, and that lady that told me to get over myself and rip up my resume gave me great advice. She said, 
Here's the alumni uh, book. Start calling people. Don't ask them for a job. Ask them for advice. Ask them about their experiences and ask them if they can introduce you to three people. And really, it's the best advice I ever got in my life. And I do it today. Like, so I, I, I think you, 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 you become a friend, you help people, and you don't think, ask for things in return. And eventually in life, if you do that enough times and that's the way you operate, um, you know, it's going to help out. Right now, you know, we had a little problem in one of our companies and we had, uh, we had somebody now that we put in to run a business uh, in, in Australia. And I always remember the, the guy who worked for me at IMG and his family was in New York for the weekend. This must have been like 2008 or 2009. I really liked the guy and I wanted to show the guy that I cared about him and his family. So I put him and his family up at a hotel. I, I, I planned activities for them for the weekend. And, you know, 15 years later or 13 years later, when I needed help in Australia, you know, that when I called that guy, he was there for me. And I didn't do the thing 13 years ago to get something. But I promise you, what I did that weekend is still remembered to this day. So if you operate that way, you know, good things really come back. You never give to get. But in giving, you always get more. Uh, you, you always get more than you gain. And I think if you just approach things that way, and, you know, nobody's perfect. I've made mistakes, but if you approach things that way, I think in the long run, you're going to be happier and more successful. And to that point, uh, George, you can attest: the sports industry, the sports business, is fairly small, and so you can really be connected to a lot of different aspects of the industry. Uh, especially, you and I have been in this business a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's a small business. The world gets small really fast. And look, everybody makes mistakes, but how you treat people, how you handle things, and particularly how you handle things when they don't go well, really, really matter. How you handle things when they go well really doesn't matter as much. But when things are going bad, how you handle a situation is just so important. As we end up here, George, I know you get this often. Young people come to you or a parent comes to you and says, George, Give my child some advice. They want to be the next George Pine. They want to get into the business of sports. What do you tell them? I tell them to get some fundamental skills, either inside or outside of sports, you know, um, either intern and work and apprentice in some really interesting companies for good people or get other skills outside of sports that could be applied to sports. I think it's really getting valuable experience that translates inside or outside of sports is the most important thing. And finally, you see so many opportunities in sports. You see around the corner on so many trends in sports. What areas are you keeping your eye on most closely as we enter into 22? Well, certainly the technology is changing everybody's life and disrupting everybody's life. So we like technology because of the margins are higher and the growth fundamentals. So I think that's really, and then and really data and direct to consumer. Look, TV audiences, at linear are going to get smaller and smaller. So it's the connection between the consumer and the, and the property are going to become more valuable. The people and things that are better at that are going to do better and investments around those things are going to be more valuable and where the actions is. You know, if you think about it simply, it's season ticket list. Well, I'll send you a season ticket list. And then maybe because things are changing a little more competitive, I have more elements in the season ticket list. That's going to morph and it's morphing into, I have a relationship with the consumer. I want to develop, send him all, he or she, all kinds of interesting content and information that's relevant. And I'm building a day-by-day -day relationship with that person. And I think the people that are better at that are going to be more successful in the future than those that aren't, especially with the shrinking you know, television audiences to that point, that direct relationship with the consumer going to be vital. You know, George, on the I Factor, a lot of our uh, people are watching this. Some are listening to this on the audio. If you could, it looks like at the home office here, we've got some artwork or some uh, prints on the wall. Give a little bit of uh, significance of what you have hanging there for the people who are watching or listening. All right, so I'm just a, a, good, a boy from Boston. So we got uh, uh, Rob Gunkowski right there, way over. In the corner, you got Larry was my idol. Yep. The show, uh, you know, brought John F. Kennedy, uh, like anybody else from Massachusetts, and of course my family. Those are the the elements that are important to me. Uh, growing up as a kid, the Patriots, the Celtics, and JFK 
you know, what else would an Irish Catholic from Boston uh, find relevant? And, and family, of course. So a good and a good mix there. So George Pine, an SBJ 40 under 40 Hall of Famer. Thanks for sharing your personal journey with us on SBJ I Factor. Thanks, Abe. Thanks for having me. Always good to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for joining SBJ I Factor today. Remember to subscribe to SBJ I Factor wherever you listen to your podcasts and listen to our future episodes that will hit every two weeks. Thank you.